Good morning. Morning. Ooh. I'm your alleged moderator, Jim Nesbitt. Um, I, I trust that most everybody's been able to get in to the um, Zoom now with the passcode. Have we got everybody, all the panelists here? Okay. Uh, we're already running 11 minutes late. So um, I'm just going to do a brief intro and then uh, I think toss it to y'all to discuss some of the elements I'm going to mention in the intro. So here we go. Good morning. I'm Jim Nesbitt. Um, I'm a uh, author of three award-winning uh, hardball crime thrillers set in Texas and northern Mexico. And uh, uh, we're here to talk about uh, character development. And uh, I think this is one of the more important aspects of uh, storytelling. And uh, I think one of the things that uh, um, it's something that gets um, defined in a rather cliche way a lot of times by folks that don't really understand, you know, what all the elements of character development. They think it's if you give your character a dog or a wife or a girlfriend or a child, that's character development. And I think that's a pretty limited way, <laughs> cliched way of, of uh, approaching that. I think the main elements of character development are, you know, dialogue, you know, interaction between you know, your, your characters uh, through dialogue, uh, internal dialogue, what the right, you know, what the character thinks, um, flashbacks, uh, voices in his head or her head. Um, I think those are effective ways to show character without telling it. And um, I think the, the one I particularly like is um, how characters, you know, and this could be major characters or minor characters, how they respond to their surroundings. I think too many writers, were, you know, they write scene, scenes as if, uh, you know, landscape or whatever, wherever their character is, kind of like, uh, you know, flats on a, uh, you know, on a stage. And in my mind, the, you're missing a golden opportunity to have a keenly defined setting that your characters react to or abhor or whatever, and uh, it helps you, you know, define them. So that's enough um, jabber from me. What I'm going to do is uh, toss it to, um, well, Ellie's staring me right in the face here, so I'm going to toss it to you and, and give me your thoughts on the importance of one of these factors, uh, dialogue, and how you use it. Uh, for dialogue, I would just say keep consistent with your characters, um, with whatever dialects they use and the type of vocabulary that they have. Um, you also want to be careful. I've seen a lot. Uh, I've seen a lot of writers uh, kind of have every character sound the exact same when they're talking. They have the exact same dialect, the exact same terms and phrases that they use, the exact same idioms, even if they're from different parts of the world. Uh, you really want to keep that consistent, but differentiated with your characters to actually make them feel like real different people. Because uh, when that does happen, I get really confused about who's talking. Uh, <laughs> I, I've, been accused, I've been accused of that, but I think that's an excellent point because, uh, um, you know, if you're not careful, since it's coming out of your head, it may sound all alike. It may be witty dialogue, but it, it, it may sound alike. I think what we're getting at also is, is the classic, you're showing, you know, through how yeah. these guys are interacting who your characters are not telling people. But I think I think it's key that you pay attention to how does this person sound? Uh, I had a character who was a hitman out of New Orleans. So, you know, I used to go to New Orleans a lot. I adapted some of the, the yat phrasing, but I also had a couple of signature, uh, you know, verbal tics. You know, he, he would call, he would end his sentences if he was talking to somebody, he'd end it with guy, meaning you understand me, guy? <laughs> that kind of thing, you know, just 
you, know, you got to do the brokering rule. You know, little dab will do you, but that's the kind of thing that distinguishes. But I interrupted you. Like, proceed. Uh, well, uh, also in fantasy, since it's the it's the main genre that I read, um, especially high fantasy. Um, I think some of the times that I've had disconnects as a reader is when uh, the characters talk about the world that they have lived in their entire lives mm -hmm. as if they haven't lived in it their entire lives. And um, wow. yeah, it's, it's uh, I guess you would kind of call it um, like a, a psychological discrepancy with them, you know, like a, how if, if in your head you're thinking of something negative, but you're verbally saying something positive and you like, you shake your head when you're saying positive, it's like you say yes and no, um, it kind of gives a little bit of tells sometimes. Um, so it, it's something kind of like that where if the characters don't talk about the, the place that they're in, the world that they're in, or about the creatures or talk to the creatures that are in the setting that they should have been in their entire lives, then I can't really believe that it's a real place at all. It just kind of ruins the, uh, the immersion for me. Yeah, and you're talking about an interaction between your character and that setting. Yeah, because the as city, if they actually live there. Yeah, yeah, because the setting itself is a character. It's its own separate character. And its dialogue is really in its body language with what's happening in the world. And so it needs to interact with the characters who are walking on it. I think Paul yep. raised his hand. I'm going to move to somebody. Uh, somebody got their hand raised there. Oh, <laughs> I was just saying hello to somebody. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, well, I you know, like to that. That, no, that immediately hello. put you on the spot. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I realize that it, now. <laughs> playing off of what Ellie just talked about, about you know, and it's Ellie. I'm a uh, you know, this is one of my favorite things. Car uh, scene ought to be. A character unto itself. It's, it's it's almost like you've been reading my brain pan again. Um, so, Paul, what are your thoughts on that, and uh, and how you use that, or how that should be used, to develop your character and show who he or she is? Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna talk about description a little bit about kind of describing your characters, and what I've always found is that readers um, like the less is more approach as you say you know that the less description possibly the better so that it's not i mean i've seen i've seen different authors describe people as looking like i don't know mickey rourke or, or whoever which no, immediately that. puts that yeah immediately puts that kind of image in a reader's mind which you don't want to do you want to allow a reader to the kind of you know the minimal description of like hair and you know if somebody's got a stoop maybe or something like that you know, just describe enough to kind of like put put a picture in your reader's head, but they come up with half the half the kind of description themselves, if that makes sense, because then they're kind of participants in that. You know, exactly. They're, they're, they're not watching. The they're not watching TV. They're actually using their brain absolutely. to read your book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, and, that's, and, that's, and what you just you know. mentioned, like he looks like Mickey Rourke, and it's like yeah. unless you're using <laughs> that reference to to yeah. turn a line, you're like yeah. Yeah, because yeah. like for me, uh, those kind of references uh, mean nothing to me. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I really don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know celebrity <laughs> names most of the time. Uh, yeah. Stuff like that. So if I see a random name, I'm just going to be like, I don't know what that means because I don't know what he looks like. Yeah, yeah. Plus, it could be yeah. Mickey Rourke now or Mickey Rourke 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And yeah. then your book lives on for 20 more years. I think it works dead yeah. and nobody knows what it looks like. Yeah. I mean, you run into that if you read occasionally uh, uh, Chandler or Hammett make mm. very, very rarely, but they'll make a you know contemporary reference it's like, well, I wish I knew who that was. So, yeah, mm. you know, that's all right. I mean, it's, got, it's, got two, two other guys that uh, uh, are with us, Chris. And Mario, one of you guys weigh in on this point. 
Well, um, going back to the dialogue, uh, one of the things I found that flattens a character out when they're speaking is, is small talk. Uh, they walk in a room, meet character B, and it's, hi, how are you? Great. How'd you sleep? What'd you eat? You get to the main point because when you, when you have all that preamble, uh, you're just flattening out both characters, making both seem very generic and wasting no, readers' good. time that, as well. But, you, you, you got to make that dialogue count. I mean, that's yeah. something I learned as a journalist. You know, my line is quotes are the, uh, are the paprika of a, of a story and it's underscoring and showing, uh, you know, who this person is and what they think about, you know, what, what the story is about. I think the same thing applies in a novel, you know, make it count, you know, make it memorable and entertaining, you know, that, if it if it's like boring and generic unless the guy's thinking in the back of his head something else right. and you're talking about that you know eliminate you know the kind of how you doing good to see you. i mean you're dead on there i mean and you're making your characters boring and mundane on point two on the minimalist descriptions um take uh, for example game of thrones uh, he did such a good job of minimalizing his descriptions that when the, the TV show came out, most people would say, that's exactly how I pictured Cersei, or that's exactly yeah. how I pictured the Hound, yeah. um, mm -hmm. because he left enough to their imagination that they could fill it in. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think, again, the point is, make it pay, uh, you know, and don't load it up. I mean, if it's pertinent, you know, if it's in the service of the story, or if it's in the service of etching this person out you know do it quick do it vividly and then shut up so <laughs> brother chris uh we have not heard from you yet or did we did, am, I, am i getting my second two guys uh, confused that's yeah, mario's turn now yeah mario hello well, everybody uh well thank you for uh, being on for, for uh, having this opportunity to be on the panel and being among this august buddy of, of writers jim especially I, I really love your book so i feel really honored being on this panel here and i think we have to we have to thank Kay because putting on these things is a lot of work and there's a lot of little bits and pieces that sometimes don't don't quite fit together when they should so i have to uh, applaud her for what she's done here um, yeah Kay's so, great yeah and and, and and i appreciate the compliment toward me but uh Clearly, you need to get out more often. <laughs> so, so anyway, dialogue. well, well, for for dialogue, let me just say that uh, um, I think everybody's kind of covered a lot of the points that I was going to mention about dialogue and then about description. Uh, you know, whatever is relevant, because you know what what you notice tells you about yourself. Okay, if somebody comes into a room, you know that particular person looks something like this, and then in particular, if you have a detective right say and he sees somebody i mean he's always sizing people up and they're looking for some particular things and uh well somebody else would look for something else um and also i think in character development we have to think about what is the character's agenda i know in a lot of uh times when i uh, mentor new writers i ask them that and they're like i don't know and i said well <laughs> the character has to have an agenda and sometimes if they have a the, like the villain in the story who might not necessarily be like an evil, you know, mad scientist villain, but let's say like the, the bad mother-in-law, for example, you know, those characters are often easier to write because we know what their agenda is and they're, they're unrestrained in what they want to do and how they want to get it. And so that's why it makes it so much fun and, and sometimes easier to write the bad characters. While the good characters, people are kind of like, well, they're the good character and I go, well, they have to have an agenda. What do they want? And what are they willing to do to get it? And of course, what's keeping them from getting that? And if you ever read a book, I mean, a, 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 you know, in a story, one of your favorite ones, oftentimes, and getting back to what Jim was talking about, internalizations, is your character will often stop and, and say, what do I want? What am I doing? What's the next steps? And it's something that you have to do. And if you do that in your story, then that helps you keep your story on, you know, on track. And it helps us understand what the character you know, is. It's part of character development. And sometimes they don't know what they want or they think they know, but it's something else. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's okay that, that this person is doubting or wondering, you know. Uh, you also, with, with, you know, and, and by agenda, I'm, I'm sure none of you guys would mean 
a checklist you go down in a kind of pedantic way. I think it's something you reveal as you go along um, in in moments, and it creates another opportunity to to you know reveal character by other means. You know, in the middle of dialogue, maybe, or you know, as uh, that person's reacting to the scene. So I'm thinking you know, it's all it's all elements that you should you know, juggle well and um, not, um, you know, you're not writing a psychological profile on your guy. Uh, you're revealing as you go along. Um, you know, that's, that's I think, the, um, you know, the point. Well, Let's let me just the- say, for example, in dialogue, you could have, for example, your, your protagonist and the sidekick, that's the value of the sidekick is because the sidekick can often push back against the, the protagonist and ask him, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> what's, what's going on? Or why are you doing that? Or I disagree with this. And it helps you flesh out both the plot of the story and it reveals character and it reveals the character of both, of, of both the individuals. I had that happen in my first novel when a character I meant to be a throwaway just took over a chapter and then she became essentially almost the co-lead of the book. And her interaction with my main character, I mean, it defined them both and it drove the action, it drove the dialogue. And it's like, thank God I didn't hit the delete key on her. You know, I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's just marvelous. Hey, let's do something here on my, the pet peeve, which will cause me to like jump out of the screen at you and, uh, um, you know, yell and rant and rave the cliche or the most in my mind the most cliche uh thing that people sometimes mean when they talk about character development <clears throat> given the person a wife a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a husband a dog a child uh, let's uh uh let's go back to ellie what do you think about that i know you're writing in a different world but but the the what to you are the cliche ways people refer to as character development uh i don't even know what you mean by the giving somebody a wife or a child do you mean just slapping them on there and not ever doing anything with them as far as interacting with the character yeah i think i think too often i think that's exactly what you know what they mean and it's like to me that's very cliche uh I and mean, not very effective. red shirts have a place in the story, but it'd be nice if it's your protagonist who is supposed to be a real person with real relationships, if they seemed like they had real people with their relationships, you know? So I guess if it's, I guess they call it the sexy lamp theory. Um, <laughs> You do you elaborate on that. that. I, 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 okay. I love that. Yeah, there's there's definitely a thing, especially in science fiction and fantasy, um, where if you have usually a female character who's part of your story and she's supposed to be like your co-star next to the protagonist, and if you can replace them with a sexy lamp and the story doesn't change they don't need to be in the story. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah, and I think that, that, that you've given us the, you know, the fantasy version of, you know, the wife, girlfriend, you know, just the prop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, you know that's, what I, that's what I'm getting. I, I, and why this sets me free and you know, causes me to grouse. I had, I, one of my books was up in a contest and I forget what contest it was, but two judges, almost as if they had a discussion among themselves, uh, you know, basically slammed me for lack of character development. And if you've ever read the the sagas of Ed Earl Birch, I would say he's got character out the wazoo uh, and, and, and you get to see it. It may not be nice character traits, but it's character. But you know, the by character development, I was clear that those folks meant the sexy lamp, the the you know the prop, the I want to see his softer side, you know that kind of thing, you know, and just just 
to meet that check, check mark thing you, you have on your list. So sexy lamp. Hey, you've given me a new one. Thank you. You're welcome. So, Paul, what are your thoughts on the sexy lamp? <laughs> I love that. Oh. I, 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 am, I, I am writing that down. Funny. No yeah. more sexy yeah. lamps. Yeah. I mean, just to just to kind of go back to the dialogue thing, thing again of having like um, cardboard cut, cut out characters that are just there to say, well, what do you mean by that? And what do you, you know, so the, yep. so the main character is given a, is given a character by responding to these kind of cardboard cut out characters. And that's how he's, his character is. If a character, you know, if you, as you say, if you can take that character out and still have the same, you know, effect, then what are they doing there in the first place? If you if you, if you haven't given that that peripheral character a character, if that makes sense, then what are they doing? They're not. They shouldn't just be there to reveal the main uh, character's uh, traits and. No, and and, so and, that's that's a pet peeve. With yeah, me. you're you're dead on with that because they ought to, you know they ought to serve the story as much as the main character does. And if they are well-defined unto themselves, they're going to help you reveal that other guy, your protagonist yeah. or your villain's Absolutely. character all the more, but, but yeah. it shouldn't be a cardboard thing. It's not a cutout, no. you know, that, no. that, uh, I mean, you're not going to, you're not going to create energy and drive and interest with a cardboard character and your protagonist, you know, it's like no. make it a real person, you know, give them some, yep. give them some depth and some characteristics it's that are, it's that not took the reader. It's also not just characters, especially with fantasy. Again, um, if you've got a character with special magic abilities mm -hmm. and every time they use it, it's completely unnecessary because you could have just kicked the dude in the face. <laughs> <laughs> and it would have been the exact same result. What's the yeah. point of them having the powers? There's no yeah. point to it. It's just a fun little, yeah. you know, gimmick at that point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I and I think the thread through all that is make it count, have a purpose, give them some uh, depth so that there's something for your main characters to play against and and mm -hmm. uh, uh, and who knows if you start going down that road, you may wind up with a you know, a second lead, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, let's see, Paul. Any other points on on the uh, on the cliche character <laughs> um, development? Um, just the thing of like, you know, that they, some people use that those cardboard cutout characters so that the main protagonist can do an info dump of kind of exposition and stuff like that, and that's that's a big kind of pet pet peeve of mine where the main character just does this big kind of info I'm so clever I know this about yep. whatever it is instead of in a natural like organic way that's a that's a bit of a pet peeve of mine <laughs> where the info dumps are there all right Chris weigh in on this what's what what's your what's your biggest pet peeve when somebody says character development in a way that we don't agree with well, first off, Ellie, because you're wearing a black blouse, it looks like you have a cat head coming out from the side of your chest. Um, yeah. Paul, I'm, I'm glad somebody has the guts to drink champagne straight from the bottle first thing in the morning. Oh, it's water. <laughs> um, one of the, th the most cliche things I, I see is um, people whose main character gets it from the start. What he wants is what's going to be the, the solution to his problems. Um, one of the things I, I picked up in my university studies was a character triangle um, where you have uh, the character's wants, the character's fear and flaw, and their character's needs, because their needs should conflict with their want. It shouldn't always be the same thing. Uh, and when I read a, a, a book or a story that's got a main character who, as soon as that problem arises, knows exactly what he needs to do, that takes the conflict out, makes him very flat and very cliche and very, um, yeah, he could almost not be in the story. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, your main character can right. almost not be in the story. Yeah. You know, I think, and that goes to another like truism, and a truism I actually believe in, and it's not a cliche, is that everything should be in service of the story. It ought to point inward and be driving that story forward. You know, the story you you want to tell, not throwing in anything because the market expects it or 
re even readers expect it or your agent is demanding you put it in so he or she because he or she can't figure out another way to you know, sell your book so um the one example i can i can think of off the top of my head mario you wrote a story about uh, uh kids who find a, a genie lamp and turn it into a bong yeah and the, <laughs> what he wanted and that was a larger manhood not necessarily what he needed to get through the, the conflict of the story because it was yeah telephone pole but that, that was an example of the, the need clicking with the want yeah and it didn't turn out well <laughs> no <laughs> so mario since he's tossed it to you play on through there and uh, and, and what's your when somebody starts talking about character development, what, what what's what's your least favorite cliche, uh, or when you read it in a book or see it in a movie? Well, when when characters are are or they have cliched character traits, and I kind of want and, and I often advise my students I, or suggest to them is to play against type, where for example you could have a very gruff individual, and then yet the, that the individual at some point would be very sensitive to things because it might play on like you could have like this really mean drill sergeant, for example, you know, who has his part to play. But beyond that, you could find out that part of the reason he is this way is because of, of the way that he, that, that he grew up and that he does not want other people to suffer what he suffered through, you know, in, in some regard and kind of open, open that up um, with, you know, and, and that's kind of like the peeling away of, of the characters. I think uh, something that, uh, uh, both Jim and, and Chris mentioned would be is what we call a fatal flaw, which would be something about the character that they're their own worst enemy. Okay. And, and for example, somebody who's a perfectionist, okay. When you think, oh, that's a good thing, but this person being a perfectionist might be very hard to work with. And at the same time, they think they're always right. Right. So yep. you have this protagonist who's, you know, kind of like a Sherlock Holmes kind of a character, but sometimes you know, they think they're always right. And then sometimes in thinking they're always right, they tend to overlook things. And then when they make a mistake, they won't admit it. And then oh, yeah. And, and what you're talking about is flaws that I think make characters much more interesting. Correct. You know, it's, it's like, Correct. And, it, and it provides contrast to whatever virtues they've got. You know, I mean, when oh, I wow. set out creating uh, Ed Earl, um, uh, you know, I didn't want them to be, you know, I just had a couple of ground rules. I didn't want them to be like super smart, like Sam Spade or, you know, Phil Marlowe. Um, I didn't want them to be super cool, like Steve McQueen in Bullet. I wanted them to be, you know, flawed uh, in, in ways that were obvious to anybody who, who knew him. And uh, I, I just thought that made for a more interesting character who, you know, if he prevails and wins, he does so in spite of his flaws or because maybe his flaws somehow work around to give him some kind of advantage. To me, that's more interesting than a guy who's like, oh, the Jack Reacher types, you know, I right. mean, that, that just, you know, those, those um, seamless characters just bore the hell out of me. So let me just say, Jim, that I admire your hat. <laughs> and uh, you know how hard I had to I had to search for a long time because I've got a big bucket head. I need something to cover up the bald spots, but I I, I have a size eight head, and uh, I had to search all over the place to find somebody who make a good palm leaf straw. Sunbody oh. hats, they're they're great. So I just um, I just bought a cowboy hat, and the problem is now I have to learn how to ride a horse. So. <laughs> Well, I, I did that a long time ago, and unfortunately, both of my knees are too shot to let me ride horses and motorcycles, so I've opted for a 72 Olds Cutlass convertible. Okay, so, there you go. Let's see. I'm trying to keep track of time here. The, you know, we've talked about dialogue. What, what do you all think about another way uh, to develop character? Um, well, let me just say, the fact that you have this Oldsmobile cutlass convertible reveals a lot about your character 
You see, and that's one of the things that you could have in, in a character. I mean, one character, remember in Colombo, he would drive that piece of crap yeah. uh, Peugeot a car around, right? And that was his signature. Um, and, and, you know, so in, late, recently I've been watching a lot of the old Colombos from the 70s and the 80s, and I really appreciate them a lot more now than I did then. And that character that he has and the way that he would just lay out the trap for for the, uh, you know, for the, the, the bad guys. And, you know, that thing, uh, just one more thing. <laughs> yeah, you, are, thing. you always knew who did it when he constantly mm -hmm. says one more thing. Yeah, one more thing. That yeah. person, you always know who it is from that. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and by saying all, by, by damning the cliche uh, character development uh, uh, tropes, you know, there's a reason why cliches are cliches. They serve a purpose at, at some point. And I think it's, how you use that device, whether it's clever, whether it's interesting, whether it's, you know, reveals something about the character or whether it is that version of the sexy lamp. I mean, right. I, you know, it's and okay are, to use that, but, you know, be interesting about it and make it count. And cars are a darn good way to do it. Uh, remember Magnum PI? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He drove a Ferrari, but it wasn't his. He was basically seen as leeching off um, Robin exactly. was his name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, by the way, Paul, I I I, I do give Ed Earl a cutlass in the uh, in the work in progress. So, uh, um, so uh, I I must have I, I must have heard you telepathically. Yeah. I met Mario. Sorry about that. Okay, that's fine. I to say. <laughs> I'm looking at Mario and, and uh, your name, Paul, is, is, is like yeah. <laughs> like first on my list and I saw Paul, so forgive yep. me. Oh, sorry. That's all right. All right. So, so what, um, one of the things I like to do is, is I do a lot of flashbacks. So let's go around the horn and talk about that. I mean, I think it's a good way to um, reveal character and, and continue you know, give backstory and, you know, continue the action in another format sometimes. Um, what are, what are y'all's thoughts about use of flashback in terms of character development? Paul, go ahead. You're, you're staring at me on the screen. Um, I, I think again, it's use it sparingly. Um, and also it, if you can get away with not using it, then you know it throws you out of the story, the main narrative of the story. If you do a flashback, so if you're going to do it, do it with a purpose, you know, a specific purpose in mind. I think, and you can even misdirect a reader by not showing who's in the flashback or who it's from the point of view of a certain person, and then later on you find out who that person is. You can do specific things that way. So it it, it has its use, flashback definitely, but. Uh, You've got to use it. It's like everything else. You've got to use it sparingly, haven't you? You know, rather than just kind of like a flashback to show that he likes animals, or a flashback to show that you know, <laughs> yeah. whatever it is. It, is it a it central purpose? You've got it. You know, yeah. is it a central story purpose, not just a side yeah. one? You know, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely. Yeah. All right, guys, jump in and take take Paul's lead and tell me uh, what you think <laughs> about flashbacks. I love flashbacks. Just I can't get enough of them. Um, you definitely want to. You definitely want to make sure that. Sorry, uh, toddler came downstairs. Um, <laughs> you definitely want to make sure that uh, when you do flashbacks, that you're not using eighty percent of your story as just flashbacks, and then like twenty percent of the present time plot. <laughs> That's a no no. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, you gotta maybe flip it around. Maybe like. 10% flashback, 90% story, yeah. like the present time story. Cause I love jumping back into some of the characters like memories because um, I write first person but I switch perspectives through multiple characters. So I have a lot of fun with taking one person's memory of a, of a scene and then having a different character having a, the same memory of a scene from their perspective but it's not adding up because there are some discrepancies between the two and they're and then yeah. they and figure out why exactly do they have different memories of the same scene? Like, what were they missing and what was this character missing? And so they try and like figure out together what the actual story was. 
the latest the latest thing I saw that used that I thought fairly effectively, particularly that switching point of view, uh, zero zero zero. Uh, you know, I I didn't like. I mean, the, the overall the uh, the uh, the it kind of a limited series. It was kind of flawed, but they did use that device to good effect. And uh, um, I'm nodding at you because like, you. You and I seem to like approach the same way. I will overuse flashbacks, and plead guilty, but it's for a purpose, you know, and it's not a sideshow, um, you know. So, so that's, you know, I don't know. I, 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 I feel like I, I, I should be sending money to your offshore account, Ellie, because you, uh, <laughs> we, we think a lot alike. All right, uh, Chris and Mario, what, a, what, what, what are your thoughts on flashbacks? Hey, Mario. Okay. Uh, well, I, I, I think flashbacks are, are, are important. You just th you think about the way we think. Our minds are very complex and we're in and out all the time. Flashbacks in our own existence here. Uh, the, the difficulty, of course, in, you know, in writing something, you know, if we did it that way, everything would be very stream of consciousness and, and it'd be very hard to follow the story. So one of the things that I tell my, uh, students is that Every time you go on a flashback, it has to serve a purpose. And I think, as, as Paul mentioned, every time you go on a flashback, it slows the momentum of the story. It stops it. So when you use a flashback and you go back into the story, what that flashback should do is add momentum to the story, right? Yeah. Because you Absolutely. stopped. And then it's almost like you've spring-loaded the story. And then when you come back into the, 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 the present story, it just shoots forward. Yep. in that in that regard um so most of the time flashbacks tend to be like you know two or three sentences maybe a passage um there's that book uh the daughter of smoke and bone by Leanna taylor and she has a whole chapter that is a flashback but when she comes out of that chapter you're like oh my god because <laughs> everything in the story comes is, is suddenly much more vivid and much more intense because now you realize what the backstory is to what's going on in the story. She did. I mean, that was uh, uh, that was the exception that proves the rule in her regard. Just the yeah, she added rocket fuel in the flashback. You That's know, correct. I mean, yeah. she she really she really you know supercharged the uh, story. And again, it serves a purpose. Right. You know, I mean, it, uh, you know, it's you're creating momentum. You're adding energy. You're not subtracting from. The line of your story so I, I, I that that sounds great uh, I'll, I'll pick up that book <laughs> <laughs> I tend to have um, to treat dream scenes and flashbacks the same uh, they're like like garlic you put too much of in your recipe it's going to taste like crap uh, and they've got to be used right uh, if Mario's example was, was perfect um, I, I think there's there's two things readers tend to skip over in a book prologues and flashbacks Unless they're both done really, really well and very necessary to the story. Um, we never skip prologues. Never. <laughs> we love them. Um, and then it's it's like that character that you didn't really need. If you can take that flashback out and the story doesn't change, you don't need it. Yeah, and I think you know, I think prologues can be effective, but they become such an expected thing. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's like. Oh, you gotta have a prologue. You gotta have a prologue. Oh, yeah, I have. No, poor Leonard never did. I know. have noticed that it's really just mostly high fantasy and epic fantasy where the prologues actually serve a purpose, and they don't just slap on some kind of preview from later on in the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I read like a some kind of uh, I read like a paranormal urban fantasy, um, like way back when, and. Uh, it had a prologue and I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. But then I got to the chapter and it was the exact same thing as the prologue. And I'm like, I already read this. Why was this in the prologue? That doesn't make yeah, sense. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, uh, it was a culture shock for me. <laughs> one of my, one of my writing buddies, Dick Belsky, like me, a former newspaper person. And he writes really fast, zippy uh, uh, mysteries uh, with a, television producer is his main character and lately his main character has been a woman television producer and uh he uh, he uses prologues effectively you know it's 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 
you know, it's, his are the only ones where I don't kind of wince while reading through them. And it serves, you know, the purpose of the story. And, and usually, I don't think he, I, I don't think I've ever read where he repeats what's in the prologue. He might make a side reference to it, but it's not, oh my God, I've read this already. You know, I mean, that's just, to me, that's just, that, that, that smacks of somebody having an agent who told them you need a prologue. And so they just lifted something from the back of the book. You know, so we are at, what do we got here? We've got about nine minutes. So I think um, what I'd well, like to- Let me weigh in on I, the prologues a little bit. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I, I'm one of those who don't like prologues. Yeah, me but too. if you do write a prologue and you want me to read it, just call it chapter one. <laughs> and there you go. <laughs> That's exactly what I did. Uh, I, I thought, well, I'm going to take a stab at a prologue. And I like, I like this. And I'm going to go to embellish it and I'll call it chapter one. I mean, yeah. I, it, you know, it, it's, you're right. Why are you calling it a prologue? What, what is that thing anyway? So, um, well, in fantasy, prologues are really more of a, of a scene setter. It's, it's not necessarily a full chapter, um, but it does kind of have a little glimpse into what you're about to get into. It's kind of an expectation setter. So yeah. it, it tells a small, small, small glimpse of what you can expect in the rest of it. And that's how prologue should be. But if it doesn't add value to the story itself, that's it should right. not be there. Everything is yeah, right. add value. And to be clear, I, I don't think any of us are saying, um, you know, prologues serve no purpose. But if they don't serve a purpose, as you just outlined, get rid of it. You know, why, why, why have it? So... Yeah. Anybody else want to weigh in on prologues or have we covered the waterfront here, guys? <laughs> if not, what I'd like to do is just go around the horn in the time we have left. And this is what I wanted to do and forgot to mention at the top. Um, talk about yourself a little bit, what you, what novel, what, what, what genre you write in and what's your latest book. So uh, Chris is staring me in the screen right now. So We're all staring you in the screen. Yeah, I know, but you're staring at me back. <laughs> All right. So um, take take a take a few minutes and just tell us about yourself and, wh well, and why you like to write in the genre you write. Well, I write in just about every genre. Uh, I've published in everything except um, thrillers, um, and, and that comes from a lesson I, I took from Russell Davis at uh, Western State. Don't try and shoehorn a story into a genre. Let it fall into the genre it belongs in naturally. Yeah, so um, I've, I've got over my shoulder there is my fantasy novel that I published through Wordfire. Over my other one is my paranormal romance I published under a different name. Uh, and I've got a dark fantasy here. And um, I used to write primarily fantasy. And then I got to the MFA program and I know everybody goes, oh, MFA is yuck. Um, the MFA program at Western State is actually for commercial fiction, mm -hmm. and not genre fiction, not uh, literary. And the first exercise they had us do is they went around the room and said, what do you write? And I said, fantasy. He said, good, write me a Western. Next question, what do you write? Science fiction, good, write me a romance. And that was the first story I sold, actually. It was the, the Western that I wrote as a result of that challenge. Um, and it really opened my eyes to, you know, genre is just a marketing ploy, really. Find, the, write the story that needs to be written and it'll, it'll come out fine. Ain't that the truth, brother? I mean, there's so much stuff out there, so much crap. Uh, either you're getting it from an agent or, you know, you now have all these, I'll help you self-publish, you know, I've got writing advice. And, and it's like, golly, I mean, I've been writing, you know, I've started out as a journalist in the, in the days when long format was the thing and magazine style. And I've, I've, I've known how to tell a story for about 50 years now. And what you're saying to me is not good story advice. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, it's marketing advice, but it's not good story yeah. advice. Yeah. All right. I, I, I stepped on your line. <laughs> well, you know, play, play through. I, I, I write for a living too. Only I write intelligence reports for the army. So yeah. that's why I haven't written thrillers, by the way. I don't do the military Tom Clancy stuff. Cause why would I take work home with me like that? <laughs> um, um, <laughs> Yeah, that, that's that's pretty much my writing career. What's your latest book? Latest book is Shadow Blade. I'm working on book two for that. 
the latest story published was um, one called Quaking Aspens. It just appeared on uh, Ember's website. Okay. I sold it to him right. three years ago. They just finally got it published. Where can we find Shadow Blade? Uh, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, online. It's not hard copy in stores yet. All right. Oh, and there's an audio version out too. You're audible. That's something I've yet to do, but I keep getting told to do it. Uh, it's it's amazing to hear somebody else read your story. It's really cool. Yeah. All right, Ellie, you're up next. All right. I forgot the question. Talk Tell about us a little yourself. bit about yourself. You know, oh, okay. what, what genre you're right in and what's your latest stuff. Give, give a little, little, little promo time. All right. Well, uh, surprise to everybody. I write epic fantasy. Uh, <laughs> this is... Um, a poster of the last book in my series that came out last year, right when the pandemic hit. So that was a fun release. Um, I'm also currently working with my narrators on book two for the audiobook. Uh, so we're getting that out of the way and you're absolutely right. It's super amazing to actually hear your book being read by amazing narrators. Um, uh, you can find my books on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Audible, um, you can go to my website, necrosine.com. That's N-E-C-R-O-S-E-A-M.com. All right. So let me make sure I get everybody in here. Paul, you're next. Uh, like Chris, I've written just about everything in, in my time. Uh, I'm mainly a horror first. I'm probably best known for my post-apocalyptic Robin Hood books. Um, at the moment, I'm writing thrillers for HarperCollins as P.L. Kane. And the latest one is Her Husband's Grave. Um, and I've got a collection out at the moment called The Naked Eye through Inside Apocalypse. All right. <laughs> Thank you, sir. And Mario, last but not least. There you go. Um, I, well, I, I've been at this game now for about 16 years as a professional writer. I got started writing the Felix Gomez Detective Vampire series, which are actually more critiques of modern culture than they are. Uh, is urban fantasy, which is, I think, is a subgenre has kind of died now. Um, and then I've, I've migrated into noir and, and horror, which uh, I really enjoy writing uh, horror stories. I've had a couple published last year from Hex Publishers. And then I just had a novel, uh, a Western novel published by Five Star Press. It's called Luther, Wyoming. Uh, I've always wanted to write a Western and finally got a chance. And it, it just came out uh, last month. And you can find that, of course, on Amazon and then, and then on the Tattered Cover website and the Book Bar website. All right, folks, uh, I appreciate your time. We've got two more minutes. Uh, is there anything anybody else wants to say about character development? Just jump on in. OK, um, well, like I said, I think uh, the uh, character's agenda is important. And we talked about the fatal flaw, keep that in mind. And then the opposite of the fatal flaw, what is your character's strength? You know, what, what, is, it, what is it that keeps driving them to, uh, going on? Uh, don't, be, don't be afraid of uh, conflict in your story. Dialogue is a great way to show conflict, even between characters who like each other. And uh, I'm jealous because my cat doesn't like to get on screen. Well, yeah, mine, mine's 21 years old and he's bitching at me because he doesn't have enough food in his bowl and he, oh. he wants me to shut up and let him get in my lap and take a nap. So, <laughs> all right, folks, I really enjoyed this. I hope you did too. And I appreciate your time. Uh, let's do what is not too often done in uh, corporate settings. Let's just uh, call it a day and end the meeting, shall we? Okay, take care. Right, bye, everybody. Thanks, guys. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it. I'll be looking for your books. Thank you.